Elliot Shibley. Welcome to Conversations with Humanity. Good to be here, Mark. Great to have you, mate. And uh, how are things today? Where are you? Tell us where you are in the world today. I am located in Hershey, Pennsylvania, also known as the sweetest place on earth. Hershey, Pennsylvania. Now, you've got to tell us what is it famous for something particular there in Hershey or what? Hershey chocolate. Oh, seriously? Is that where it comes from? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, gosh. I'm glad I don't live there. I'd be down at the factory every single day. Oh, it's amazing. Well, I will say... There are other days where it smells like cow manure and other days where it smells like chocolate. <laughs> well, there you go. There's, um, you know, that's a great thing, isn't it? Having those two smells. They're both healthy in their own kind of way, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, th- I, I lost you for a second there. It said it was trying to reconnect, but I think we're back. Oh, okay. So why don't we... Um... Why don't we just go over there again? Just say what you said about the Hershey thing and uh, we'll be good. Yeah. So the it is it is great having and living in Hershey, but there are three smells, three distinct smells. One of them is roasted peanuts because the Hershey Reese's plant is here too. Oh. Uh, one is chocolate, which is delightful, but the chocolate sometimes mixes with cow manure because we have a lot of farms around the area. So it's sometimes really difficult to tell which is which. So are we talking about Reese's peanut butter? Is that the Reese we're talking about? Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. I'm familiar with that brand. I only came across it a couple of years ago and um, haven't got any on the boat today, but it's pretty spectacular, that Reese's peanut butter. It is. And they. I think my favorite that they have are the Reese's Christmas trees. Right. Okay. Christmas trees. Okay. <laughs> that sounds yeah. Pretty interesting. They're only they're only around the holidays. That's pretty interesting stuff. Have you lived in that area for a long time? No, my wife and I moved here about six years ago in 2014. Uh, she moved. Well, actually, we both graduated from college, and she came down here to do her master's degree, and I got a job here. And then when she graduated, she got a job working at the medical center. And then I continued to work in my field, which is uh, land development, civil engineering, and real estate development. Oh, fantastic stuff. So where were you before that? Where did you come from? Well, Amanda, my wife, and I both grew up in the Reading area. I don't know if you're familiar with the Monopoly board game. Yes, of course. So there are four railroads. There's the Reading Railroad, which is the first one which yep. some call it the Reading Railroad. I have to correct you, it is not. <laughs> but that's where, Reading is where that uh, came from because Reading had a very large railroad industry that tied into Philadelphia. Ah, okay. Well, yeah. you've, you've just blown some of my knowledge away because I always thought Reading Railway Station was in the UK. Uh, well, that's where Reading got its name. Ah, okay. Okay, so now we're going back in history and going on to global affairs here. Okay, interesting. Yeah. I actually love Monopoly. I haven't played it for a long, long, long time, but I love that game. I do too. My I used to play with my grandfather all the time. And, you know, growing up, you don't really know much about their personal lives until later and you get to know them a little better. But he and my grandmother had several of their own properties that they rented out, they did flips on. And whenever I played with him, I always was at a loss for why I kept losing. And it was because he had real world knowledge on this. (laughs) (laughs) And it made a lot more sense when I learned that. Don't you love grandparents though? They're so cool when it comes to doing all the stuff that your parents don't want to do, right? So they they jump in there and they'll do board games. And I remember my grandfather, he he taught me how to build a tree house and, and all that sort of you know, cool stuff as a young kid and uh, never forget that stuff, you know. That's just so important, yeah. isn't it, in life's journey, you know. It is. I I haven't had a chance to see them in a while since the COVID-19 quarantine. Um, they actually both got it. They were both staying at a retirement community. Oh, wow. And they were holed up in their apartment, which is, I've been to their apartment. It is very nice. It's got three bedrooms, but they were in there for 53 days straight. Oh, yeah. are, they, are they okay? 
Are they okay now? They're both okay. Neither one had to be hospitalized, thankfully. And wow. Wow. they're both, I think, still, they're still recovering. They're clear of the virus, but, you know, it, I mean, it leaves people very weakened. Yeah, that's what there doesn't seem to be a lot of uh, noise around. You know, we hear about tragic. The, all the deaths and stuff that are going on and all the bad news associated but we don't get a lot of news about the recovery and rehabilitation process do we well we don't in this country anyway so how no. is it in the u.s do you get a lot of news about how people are coming out the other side and what their after effects are you know it's very it's very hit or miss i would say a majority of the information is still just the daily cases daily deaths but i did listen to a few segments on the radio about clinics opening specifically for post COVID recovery right? to help people basically get back on their feet and rehabilitate. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It seems to be there's something, you know, there's the numbers are just as enormous, of course, of people that are recovering successfully. And, you know, if we, if yeah. we get away from the mainstream media, that's just building the co constant case of negativity and darkness around this virus. There's a lot of positive news out there and all those people that are recovered like your grandparents. Yeah. Um, you know, they should be getting Which on gives me a lot of hope. You should be getting them on YouTube, Elliot, and telling them to tell their story about recovering from COVID nineteen. Oh, I should. I don't know if they know how to use YouTube though. <laughs> <laughs> well, they've got a grandson that can give them a lot of tutorials and mentoring, yeah. That's true. That's true. Actually, a uh, funny story. Since Bob and I started our YouTube channel uh, a few weeks ago, probably back in beginning of June. And I sent Bob, who is, for those of you listening, Bob and I host the Traveler's Blueprint podcast, but I sent him a video snippet of our format for the video episodes, but it turned out I actually sent it to my grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, go with the full, full width. I was like, all right. Fantastic. Thanks for playing along. Fantastic. Well, I'll tell you what, Bob's becoming a bit of a star because I think I've done, I think you're my ninth episode of Conversations with Humanity. I think Bob's starred on about three or four of them now. So oh, wow. He's getting uh, named out there. Now, tell us about, I'm interested to know a bit more, and I'm sure the listeners are, about your journey with podcasting and the Traveler's Blueprint. What, what, what made you guys start that podcast in the beginning? It's, it's a really interesting story, and it kind of blossomed out of our friendship um, when we were traveling in New York City together. And we were both working in an engineering firm, working on this project for two straight weeks, traveling all around to the different boroughs of New York City. And in that time, we kind of bonded over the fact that we were working 12 to 14 hour days. And the last two days we had in the city, we were able to wind down a little bit and actually enjoy some of the nightlife, some of the restaurants. And we ended up just chatting and ended up spending basically those two last nights hanging out together and found out that we had a ton in common, one of which was travel. Yeah. And so we started, we actually became really good friends over the next course of probably one to two years. And he came to me with this idea of doing a podcast. And I was like, all right, what's this podcast going to be about? And he was like, well, you like travel. I like travel. We're both married. We're both starting families soon, and we don't we won't be able to travel as nomads, but we will be able to travel vicariously through our guests. Right. So we want to continue to stay in the realm of travel, and that's that's what we've been doing for two years now. Um, we have different guests from all over the world, yourself included, just to talk about their adventures, their conservation efforts, their stories anything and everything related to travel. I don't know about you, but I find it really fascinating. Did you have anything to do with podcasts before you got into it? Like, had you been a podcast listener at least? I'm going to be honest, no. Mm. I mm. still I still don't listen to podcasts all that much. <laughs> right. okay. My wife, my wife listens to podcasts pretty much daily. Right. And she listens to three or four of them. The, the podcast that started it all for me was the Serial Podcast, which was one of the biggest and most downloaded in all time. And I saw the value in it. I saw that it is a really great medium to reach out to basically anyone and everyone that's willing to download and listen. Yeah. But 
Bob, on the other hand, <laughs> is an avid podcast listener. Right. And I think the, the difference being is that my commute was fairly short, maybe 15 to 20 minutes. And his, he was on the road quite often. And the office he worked at was maybe an hour from his house. And if he wasn't at the office, he was on the road traveling to different sites for work. Interesting that a lot of people listen to podcasts when they're doing their commute, yeah? And it's an obvious uh, solution for people. But I'm also astounded how many people listen to podcasts when they're out doing their daily activity stuff. I've got a... um, a little bit of a route that I do here in the mornings with my dog and uh, we come across a lot of other dog owners that are out walking their dogs and mm-hmm. a lot of them have got earplugs in and I'm quite rude. I go up to them and say, good morning, are you listening to a podcast? <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, you know what, about, I would say about 60 or 70% of the people that I stop to say hello to and ask them that they are listening to a podcast. So it's a growing phenomenon, that's for sure. So you guys have just got into YouTube recently, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So are you yeah, calling yourselves totally podcasters or YouTubers or what are you now? What's the label you put on this now? You know, I don't think we've officially labeled it, but if I were to put a name to it, I would say video podcast. Video podcast, okay. So um, are we going to see all these vodcasters out there now? Is that what the future holds? I think I think we are going to see some vodcasters. I like that term. Yeah. Yeah, I might coin it. I don't know if anyone's painted it yet. but <laughs> Bob and I looked into YouTube early on when we started doing the podcast, and video was, it was easy. I mean, even before the COVID-19 pandemic, when everyone went into Zoom and other online video formats for conferencing, uh, YouTube seemed like a, a good venue to, to put our podcast, but... We weren't sure how the audio was going to translate just to a video format because we weren't recording all of the visuals in the beginning. And it was interesting. Only a handful of podcasts in comparison to the rest of the population of podcasters were putting videos on. So we didn't necessarily think it was a a good idea then. But now YouTube almost seems like another form of social media where you get to know the people a little bit better and you can – we don't just put our podcasts up anymore. We put up snippets of the episodes to kind of entice people to view the whole thing. And we'll put up our own personal videos that we've done through our own travels or what we're doing while we're in quarantine. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. That's good. So you've been doing it for how long? A couple of months now, have you? Yeah, we, we've we had a backlog of our kind of our uh, audiograms and videograms since October of 2018. But it wasn't until last month, I'd say mid-June, that we put all of them up on YouTube. Yeah, right. And how's it been going? Have the numbers been strong? It's really interesting. Uh, YouTube has a ton of channel information and analytics. And we have three really popular videos out of like the 120 that we have. And two of those are about great white sharks. Oh, Okay. And they're, they're just photos. So it's a photo overlaid with text and information about the episode, who it was, what they're talking about. So it's a still image. And I think people, people are grabbed by that image because it's a shark. It's a great white jerk jumping out of the water. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. It's only 13 seconds, but it's got like 1,200 views over the first 30 days. Wow. <laughs> okay. That's cool. Yeah. I better go in search of great white sharks. I've probably got one under the boat right now, and I don't know about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All you got to do is film that, post that on YouTube, and people will watch it. Yeah, wow. That's really interesting. Well, I've only been doing it for a really short period of time as well, and I've, I've just started doing these you know, um, YouTube videos of me talking to people on Conversations with Humanity, but also my travel show and my business show have gone out to, to that world. And in the first 28 days of doing it on YouTube, the numbers have surpassed everything I've been doing uh, in the podcast world. Yeah, it, it is really interesting. And it's the analytics are surprising because it, it gives you more of a breakdown of where they're listening yeah. and not, not necessarily where in the world they're listening, but what segments of the podcast they're listening to. Like if they're skipping ahead to, say, 30 minutes into an episode yeah. and... Yeah. yeah, it is. It's we've gotten so much more engagement and 
just overall reach from YouTube that than we have in probably three or four months of our actual podcast on every other platform. Yeah, there you go. Now, you guys have been doing your Traveler's Blueprint podcast for a couple of years now, so I consider you guys to be serious and, and sustainable. A lot of people jump onto podcasting and think it's the next, next best thing and they disappear after a few months, but you guys have been in there for a while. So anyone listening today, what kind of things can you share that you've learned about being a podcaster like there's a lot of people sitting at home right now that i'm sure are thinking about oh i'm going to start a podcast show so what are some of the tips you can throw out there for people to help them oh, absolutely i think the biggest one is just perseverance and picking a topic that really interests you and the biggest thing for bob and myself is we would ultimately like to make this a side hustle that nets us some additional income and maybe it'll get us so much money that we can actually you know either go part-time at our current jobs or even quit our current jobs mm -hmm. but the most important thing to us is not making it feel like a job we want to enjoy what we do and keep it sustainable in that sense so making sure our workload <laughs> is doable on top of everything else because Bob has a two-year-old now, and my wife and I are getting ready to have kids. So we want to make sure that we're not stretching ourselves thin and making it feel like it's a chore. Mm. And I think people sometimes bite off more than they can chew mm. with a podcast. Mm. And I think that is where most people have their downfalls. They want to do this great thing. They're expecting massive numbers within like months, and it just doesn't happen. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like what you said, because I think in terms of, you know, having that balanced approach and, you know, not everyone's like me sitting on a boat with a puppy dog who can commit 24 hours a day to doing this right. So, you know, you've, right, got, right. you've got other things going on in your life and starting a family. And we had a good, I had a good chat with Bob about this in terms, of, you know, it's, it's difficult sometimes to get that balance right because you do get emotionally attached to it in terms of it drives, you, you know, you love love doing it so you want to do more of it it's like anything in life yeah. right even that reese's peanut butter if you if you start off with one teaspoon you <laughs> want to take on more and more on board right so oh yeah yeah I, f I found that to be the case as well i think in um i started off as a hobby and, and just something to do in my spare time really because uh, sitting around on the boat with not much to do but um it didn't take long for me to get the bug and then yeah. The, you know the old corporate head kicked in in the back and said okay let's turn this into a global business and let's go for it yeah so oh yeah well that's... i'll be honest bob is very much he he's working really diligently to make this into a business that nets something for us and i will say i I hope uh, I don't know if Bob and I have had this conversation yet, but he asks me every once in a while if I like my job and how much it would take for me to quit my job to do the podcast <laughs> full time. And unfortunately, every time he asks, I'm like, Bob, I really like my job. <laughs> right. It would take a lot for me to quit it because I don't. And my wife and I talk about this frequently. Is like, will we ever retire in the sense of not working? Because feeling productive in society is, it's really enjoyable. Like the last six months of this quarantine, I have been extremely fortunate to continue working from home. And there were days where I was supposed to take vacation and we were going to go to California for a week. And instead, I just kind of took one day off instead of the four that we were supposed to and did nothing. And I was like, man. That was boring. <laughs> yeah. Right. Let's talk about that. That whole concept of retirement really fascinates me because um, I'm 55 years old and I've got to a stage in my life for a number of years now where I've just been doing what I want to do in life. And I, I guess in terms of how I see the future um, is not built around identifying myself or labeling myself what I do each day. It's a case of just living the best life that I possibly can. And um I don't consider what I'm doing in this podcasting world now a job at all. It's a, it's a real, it's still the hobby that I'm going to monetize and, uh, you know, work with other people in collaboration. And I'm really big on the collaboration thing at the moment. So starting off lots of collaborations with different people around the world. And 
that's kind of like a uh, extension of a hobby. It's no different than someone sitting down and say, hey, do you want to have a game of Monopoly today? Well, do you want to sit down and have a chat on a podcast, right? Like, how difficult yeah. is that to do, right? To have a conversation with someone. Maybe we don't have enough conversations in our life. That's something else that I think is uh, another relevant topic. But this this retirement thing, you know, like, I want to be doing whatever it is I love doing until the day I take my last breath. And, and yeah. whether that's labeled a job or a hobby or whatever, um, I don't necessarily want to label it as a job because I want to be doing everything every day that I just love doing. Yeah. I, I think my grandfather and my father both kind of passed that down to me. My grandfather retired three times mm. and worked <laughs> okay. and is still working. He's in, he's almost 80, I think. And he, he just loved doing his job. And my dad as well. He's like, I don't think I want to retire. I don't want to. I don't want to just do nothing all day. I like teaching. I like writing, and I think I'm going to continue to do that until I can't do it anymore. Yeah. And I'm the same way. Yeah, yeah. I want to have that freedom and flexibility in my daily life, but I don't want to ever stop working. Mm. Yeah. Good points. I've, I've been spending a lot of time of recent months um, developing my own healthy lifestyle program that I'm helping different people around the world getting their, their physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being into a, a new level. And a lot of research that I've been reading around the scientific data about people's health when they retire from work is quite interesting because there's a huge cliff that people tend to go off, and that's with their emotional, their spiritual, and their physical um, well-being is fastly impacted by their their state of doing nothing after they leave their job. And you've got to you've got to remember, right, that when people do work, they're you know connecting and socializing with other human beings. They're using their intelligence every day. They're getting challenged in different areas of their life. They've got deadlines to meet. Um, all these different activities that we take for granted, um, when they're no longer there. And we're sitting around going, okay, what are we going to do now today? There's only so much golf you can play in a day or so much tennis you can go and play or chess or whatever. It's quite a fascinating um, piece of research to look at how people's lives actually deteriorate because they do retire. Yeah. Yeah. I know a lot of people bolster retirement as this end-all, be-all thing. Like, I'm going to work really hard. I'm going to do my 40 to 50 hours a week for... 30 years, and then I'm going to retire and do whatever I want. Well, that's 30 years of your youth, of your prime, that you aren't doing what you want to do. So I've, as I've stated before with conversations with my friends and family, is that the next day isn't guaranteed. So enjoy what you have. You should absolutely be planning the future. Like I want my retirement to be fully funded. But I am still making sure I enjoy the present as much as I can. Do you think COVID-19 and this experience that we're all going through now is changing people's kind of outlook on life and how they do live their life? I would assume it is. I would be curious to see like actual individual questionnaires or surveys done to people to see if once this quarantine, once this global pandemic has ended in the sense that we're returned to some sort of new normal that people are are saying yeah actually i don't want to go back to work full-time i want to work part-time or i want to be able to work from home more which i think if there's a silver lining to this whole pandemic it's learning that 30 percent of americans and probably most of civilized worlds can work from home so what about your inner circle, your friends and that? Have you had those conversations about whether it's changed their outlook on life and what they're, they're doing? Have, have you got anything to share from that? I, I mean, the person I talk to the most is probably Bob, but he and I saw and still see eye to eye on the subject. And I don't think we've changed our mindset much. Um, but a lot of the people in the travel realm, I think, are eager to get back out and aren't waiting. They don't want to wait for their next trip, even if there is no pandemic. Mm, mm. 
Do you think people are sick of, sick of talking about when it comes to travel, talking about trips they have done in the past? Do you think there's you know I've been watching <laughs> been watching social media and you know people are now getting that desperate that they're putting photos up of, of trips they did ten years ago and fifteen years ago, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, it is talking about past trips and even the trip that you got back on from yesterday. If you didn't go on that with the person you're talking to, they're likely not that interested. Mm. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to ask you a question that's a lot of people watching this right now have been thinking from the beginning. The picture behind you, where is it? That is Plitvis, Croatia. Oh. Bob's, Bob's wife actually took that photo. And I don't know if you can see, but in the... It's back here. So this right here is Bob. Ah, okay. There he is. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. Yeah. I've put you on full and screen so we can all see it now. So there you right, are, excellent. right up in the corner. Bob, we can see you, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> so this is actually the cover photo, cover art for our podcast. Okay. And we have our logo, uh, which is a compass, superimposed over a compass with a traveler's blueprint. But that's what you'll see whenever you download our episode on pretty much any podcasting platform. There you go. So a nice picture from Croatia. Yeah, it's a it's beautiful water there. It looks like it's just magnificently fresh. I'd like to dive in, actually. Yeah, I would love to go there. Bob has talked so much about Croatia, and it is it was never on my bucket list until he was like, "Yeah, we're gonna do, go do a Game of Thrones tour." <laughs> Yeah, that was they did fourteen days for their honeymoon. Right, awesome. right, okay, yeah, fantastic country, Croatia. Um, the coastline, if you're into boating and sailing, um, it's got some of the most incredible coastline for sailing. Um, you've got all the major places which are very tourist orientated, but then getting inside Croatia is also yeah, there's a lot of things to do. So, um, there you go, Croatian tourist board. We gave you a big shout out on the on the show <laughs> show today. So. Elliot, this show is all about having a chat about anything and everything. Is there anything on your mind you want to um, have a go at? You know, Mark, I've really been on a kick on autonomous cars. Mm. And I don't know how Mm. much you know about it, but it is something that in the next 10 to 15 years, I think is going to change the face of this country and most of the world. And I think it's going to really impact the travel industry in general. Mm, mm. What got you into and this? Um, what got you into this passion for autonomous uh, ve- vehicles or cars specifically? All vehicles, but mainly cars. And I don't. I think it stemmed from my uh, background in landscape architecture because I'm really into urban planning and basically making cities, looking on how to make cities more sustainable and more efficient. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. transportation is a huge part of cities. And I think upwards of 30% of any city is just roads Yeah. in terms of actual land use. Yeah. And cars are a third of all emissions in the United States. And what autonomous vehicles can end up doing is replacing an entire fleet of autonomous vehicles in this country and the United States would be able to be a tenth of the size of all the cars we have currently Mm, mm. and provide more than enough efficiency to serve everyone. Yeah. I, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to go down that rabbit hole and talk about autonomous cars and vehicles because I think it's a really interesting subject and it's something that um, I wouldn't say I'm passionate about, but I'm, I'm, I'm a big Elon Musk fan, so I guess in terms of um, you know what that guy's doing in terms of inventions and SpaceX and and T- Tesla and all the other things that he's involved in, uh, in phenomenal in terms of his capacity and the way that he's bringing people together to change humanity in so many different ways. I had a guest on my business show yesterday actually who is being a property developer around the world. So I'm um, just talking mm-hmm. to some of the things that you're talking about. He's actually involved in. Um, the planning and designing of Australia's newest city. And it was interesting in talking to him because when you actually think about sitting down and designing a city, right, from from start, um, first of all, as he said, it's a, it's a long-term vision you must have. You've got to look 50 years into the future and all those things that, that you've just mentioned about 
you know, everything from infrastructure to all the services and everything else that's required and going to be required into the future, you've got to kind of have a bit of a crystal ball. So when it comes to autonomous vehicles and all the rest of it, I think there's a number of interesting opportunities. But I guess the first thing that comes to mind for me is, and that comes down to the human side of it, because we're all very cautious creatures, aren't we? And having uh, the opportunity to get in the vehicle that's you know driverless and can take us somewhere from A to B, whether it be in a city environment where the speeds are generally a lot slower versus mm-hmm. being interstate and going at a high speed. What are your thoughts around that? Do you think people are going to adopt this new technology easily or do you think it's going to be an incremental thing? I think it's going to be an incremental thing for sure. Um, I think older generations are going to be more skeptical just by their nature. And I think younger generations that have grown up with the rapid change of technology are gonna be more interested in using it. I mean, millennials already don't want to own a car. They'd rather have some kind of public transportation or walk or bike. And if a an autonomous vehicle subscription costs 5,000 a year, if that, or you just pay per use, there's no insurance. You don't have to have a garage. You don't have to have a parking space. And you can get it on demand wherever you are and for whatever you need. Mm. Um, I think there was a lot of pushback when we went from cars, or sorry, when we went from horse drawn carriages to cars. And I think it'll be the same pushback, but it usually occurs over a period of 10 years where there's basically less than 1% adoption to 50% adoption. And then it takes another 20 to 30 years to get to 90 to 99% adoption. But it's really interesting. I, I'm excited for it. I know I'll be one of the first adopters. I'm hoping that my car lasts long enough (laughs) that I can get one of those transportation as a service subscriptions. Because I personally, I love driving when it's for fun. I do not like commuting. Mm. I haven't had a car now for nearly 15 years. and How awesome is it? Yeah, it's cool because, well, I used to be a motorbike guy, so I had a motorbike for a long time, and then I did away with that. And I've actually got no other forms of transportation in my life today other than my legs and my sailboat. Those are the only two yeah. things that I have that get me around and yeah I rely on public transport sometimes and the odd Uber here and there but um, I find this whole thing of human transportation really fascinating because it's linked to our well-being as well I believe in terms of our ability to say right I'm going to walk down to the shop today to get whatever I need and that's going to be part of my you know looking after myself type thing versus hopping in the car going down and getting the groceries and all that sort of stuff right yeah. Getting back to your point, though, on autonomous vehicles, what do you think of the concept of the safety from a software point of view? Are there going to be hackers that can get into these car systems and cause chaos? I think there will be, but I think it's going to be infinitesimally small compared to the rate of accidents we have now. When 1 million people die in the U.S. a year from car accidents, and that number can be dropped down to 5,000. Hang on, a million That's... people a year die in the U.S. from car accidents? No, Mark, give me... I think I think that's right. It's one of the highest causes of death. And if you don't mind, I'm going to do a quick Google search. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's you know, qualify that. That's enormous. A million people, car accidents. Wow. You guys are lousy drivers. All right. <laughs> that is... I think that's how many accidents there were. Okay. So there were 4.4 million injured and there's about 40,000 deaths. Okay. 40,000 deaths. Okay. But 4 million injured in car accidents. Yeah. And the, the safety of autonomous vehicles, like the companies that are doing the testing for them on public roads, like Waymo, like Uber and Cruise, They are logging millions and millions of miles and have had very few crashes, period, all of them minor, like fender benders. And only, I think, one or two of them was actually the fault of the vehicle itself. 
So, so let me play devil's advocate. Shouldn't we be getting yeah. rid of vehicles off the roads altogether? Shouldn't we be getting up in the air and moving around more efficiently in the air by, you know, I, I've been watching, you know, you might have a passion about these autonomous vehicles on the ground, but I've been watching a lot of these, you know, flying cars and flying plane projects that are, are happening with different entrepreneurs around the world. And some of them at a really exciting stages right now where we can, you know, hop in a, a one or two or four seater um, flying machine that can basically lift off like a helicopter and take us to wherever a lot faster than the car's going to get us there. So what are your thoughts on that? Oh, I think that's awesome. I mean, right, we have several different forms of transportation now. I don't think anyone is, each one has its advantages and disadvantages, but I think a combination of those two are going to be great. If you, if we live in a world where all of the vehicles or 90% of the vehicles are autonomous, we essentially eliminate all parking structures in the cities and that frees up all of that space to build new residences new commercial buildings and we can essentially make all of our cities and all of our urban areas areas even more dense which promotes walking and then from i think those those personal flight vehicles are going to be perfect for intercity going from city to city like New York to Boston or New York to Philadelphia rather than taking a plane or trying to drive. Uh, but both of them are extremely, extremely fascinating. And it, mm. When they happen, and it's a when, not an if, it's going to be really exciting. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting concept. What are, What are your thoughts around, you know, listening to you talking there about, you know, density of population um, in cities and stuff. Have you been to Hong Kong? I have not been to Hong Kong. Okay. It is it is high on my list though. Okay. So Hong Kong is a hugely dense populous city um, that has many, many skyscrapers for both living and working environments. And if you went and when you go to Hong Kong, make sure you go into a local's apartment and check out how big they are because they're about the size oh, yeah. of a you know, probably one of my bathrooms here on my boat is, is probably the size <laughs> of an apartment. Um and I'm just I'm just wondering in terms of, you know, do you think as we progress into the future that when it comes to urban planning, are people not wanting to look at getting more out of the cities and getting into nature more and living in an environment where they do have a little bit more space? It's a really interesting thing and something I've actually looked at a lot over my career as a landscape architect. And I'm very interested in urban planning. Cities are by far the most efficient way for humans to live because we have everything at our fingertips and we have all of these resources close together. When you think of suburbs or rural living, the individual does have more access to nature, but at what cost to actual nature? Because you have to have more roads, you have to have more utility infrastructure and it's not multi-use. So those homes, those people are, it's, it's ephemeral in the sense that they go into the city to do their job and then that house sits empty. And that is basically useless land for 40 hours a week. And then they come back from the city and then the city dies a little bit. So I think having a appropriate mix of live and work in a close proximity that you can walk or take a transportation as a service style um, or vehicle would be the most sustainable and efficient way. Singapore is a wonderful example of a city that has greenery for everyone. They have planted upwards of 20 million trees in the last two decades or three decades just in the city. And yeah. having access, having those like parks in the city and being able to go to a national park outside the city, I think that's where humanity is leaning towards. Let's talk about Singapore. I lived there for seven years, so I've got some pretty strong insight yeah. and knowledge. Of I am very jealous. <laughs> um, first of all, hello, all my friends in Singapore. It's a wonderful place. And like any place, though, Elliot, it's got its good points and it's got its uh, you know drawbacks as well. I think if you're looking at Singapore from an urban capacity, I think or urban development capacity, it's an interesting place because I've always, well, I termed the phrase actually, 
Singapore is Disneyland with the death penalty. Um, and you can <laughs> you can work that one out for yourself. But it's been meticulously planned around its number one um, commercial environment, which is tourism, and getting people to come in and effectively moving them around as well as their own population. And they focus, um, you know, their MRT system, their subway system is probably the most efficient in the world. Uh, and their ability to get their people moving around because their founder, Lee Kuan Yew, said... Um, if people can move around efficiently, they'll spend money and mm -hmm. we can get them to their jobs, to their offices, and we can get them to their shopping centers where they can actually spend their money in the economy and keep the economy going and same with tourism as well. And Singapore's proven that because they've got a very efficient subway system called the MRT. But if you also look at it from a um, livability point of view and you talk to any Singaporean local, um, most of them would say they would love to have the opportunity to go and live in the open land somewhere in Montana or um, somewhere where they can spread their, their wings a bit. So I guess it comes back to those, you know, you you use the word efficiency a lot in your vocabulary when you're talking about urban planning. And I find that quite fascinating because um, the generation that I am, we, we talk about pleasure and enjoyment above efficiency. And we talk about being in spaces where... Um, we can actually spread ourselves out and not be around the noise and the clutter and the you know the fast-paced ac activity. I'm a really big proponent of tiny living, tiny house living, whether it be on a mm -hmm. sailboat or whether it be in a tiny house. Um, I've actually been involved in building a tiny house, so I know mm -hmm. how uh, amazingly exciting that that process is and what the myths around you know living small. Um, living tiny and living big at the same time because it brings a lot of efficiency. So I'm actually one of these people and I've got a good friend in the United States who actually runs the Tiny House Association of America. And Oh, interesting. There's some really uh, cool things that... Hi, John. <laughs> How are you going, mate? Um, <laughs> some really good things that uh, John does. He holds festivals all over America dur during the year uh, for tiny house owners. And not only tiny house owners, anybody that's interested in building a tiny house or getting into that minimalistic lifestyle. And people come from all over the world to attend these amazing festivals where a group of people come together to talk about that whole tiny living community, right? And it's, it's not just about having a tiny house, but it's about effectively managing the environment. And you talked before about, you know, how we if we do live outside of the cities, how our impact is on the environment. And I can probably share with you about 100 cases today where there's people that have gone to live in nature um, and there's some extraordinary innovative things. You can check them all out on YouTube where people are living in caves around mm -hmm. the world and they've, you know, they've developed uh, the caves to a stage where they're fully off-grid and sustainable, which I think is fascinating, with very little impact in, uh, in the community, uh, sorry, on the environment. You've got a guy in Canada who's one of the world leading tree house builders, and he's building oh, yeah. houses and trees, right? Yep. And I find that really fascinating as well. And some of the structures that he's been able to create are phenomenal. And they, you know, you walk past a tree and you wouldn't even know there's a house up there. Like, you know, if you're if you're kind of non plus about what's going on around you. Um, so I think we we as human beings, my belief is we have the ability and we have the innovation and the creativity to be able to immerse ourselves within the environment without having a negative impact necessarily. But all those things that you mentioned in terms of connectivity, and I think, you know, you talked about at the beginning of the show about COVID-19 and people working from home. What's wrong with us all d disappearing into nature and living and um, getting on the internet and doing businesses from there and having digital clients around the world making us incomes that create create sustainability so we don't have to get in an autonomous car and drive into a city <laughs> and, and live. I just want to play devil's advocate for a few minutes. No, here I, of... I get you. <laughs> I think to, to add to your list of awesome communities, there are things called Earthships in New Mexico. If you're not familiar with check them out. Yeah, yeah. Earth, um, Earthships are cool. Yep, very much. Well, I, I think that is a... All of those communities are, are are truly amazing, and I think it's great what they've done. But a lot of people, <clears throat> myself included, may not necessarily feel comfortable giving up other luxuries to live that lifestyle. And at the end of the day, we still want to go to restaurants. We still want to go to a pub or you know a club to hang out with people. And 
unfortunately, a lot of people don't have the opportunity to be able to work from home because there's a lot of service industry related jobs that are that require you to be at a physical location. Let me play devil's advocate again on that one then, because mm-hmm. I, I think and we're seeing this during COVID-19. I've got friends that are in this uh, particular space at the moment. I think this period of history that we're going through now has made a lot of people realize that what they actually did for a job, they didn't enjoy doing it. And oh, yeah. unlike yourself, who's happy, and I hope your boss is watching this video today because he'll be pleased <laughs> to hear that you're happy in your job. Um, I think there's a lot of people out there who are, are downright miserable and hate going to their job every day and haven't liked it for a long, long time. So I think there's a wonderful opportunity right now for people to sit down and have a good think when we've got some spare time on our hands and say, look, you know, maybe it's time for me to reskill myself. Maybe it's time for me to do what I'm actually really passionate about in life. And just like you and Bob are doing with your podcast show, having a mindset to say, hey, we want to monetize this and maybe make it our side hustle and maybe make it a a part-time gig or a full-time gig, that's where you've got to start the journey is making that commitment to say, okay, I'm going to put the effort into this that's required to get me to that goal, right? So Mm -hmm. I, I think there's a great opportunity for people right now to actually stop doing what they've actually been doing that's been making them miserable and actually pick up on something that they enjoy doing, which will give them that ultimate freedom. And, you know, I'll go back to the point you made. I, I agree with you totally. Look, everybody loves to do what they want to do, whether it be go to a restaurant or enjoy that life. But maybe also if you haven't tried something new for a while, it's time to try something new. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you won't know if it works until you try it. Yeah, look, I'm coming up to three years of living on a boat. And if you'd asked me five years ago, whether I'd be living on a boat for three years, I would have laughed at your face probably. <laughs> and um, I can categorically sit here and say to you today with my current view on life that I never want to live on the land again. <laughs> like, like, so Mark, I'm actually, it was one thing that I don't think we had a chance to talk about when you were on our podcast, but when you were a, <clears throat> you worked in a corporate style office for and company for 19 years or so? 22, yep. 22. Yep. And were you able to, I like myself, put a money aside to retire and essentially set yourself up for this podcast and your other two podcasts? Um, look, my, my financial plan all throughout my life has been one of um, living in the now, basically. So I've always okay. been somebody that's focused on what am I doing in my life now? What capacity do I need to maintain that from a sustainability point of view and that goes with whether it be physical intention um, emotional spiritual and financial Um, and I've always lived my life with that so if you're asking me you know 15 years ago when I was in the corporate world did I have a plan to retire to a sailboat and and live the life I'm living no I didn't have that plan Um, but I've always been prudent from a financial point of view to give myself freedom. Freedom has been the key thing in my life, all my life. So mm-hmm. I've always done what I wanted to do. Even when I was in the corporate world, I changed my job every couple of years. Um, I moved around the world and worked in different countries and different locations. So I was, I was, I don't want to use the word fortunate because I made those things happen. You know, that's through right. hard work and dedication that you get those things to happen in life as is living on a sailboat. Um, so no, I had a, I had a, I had a plan for the moment, I would say, Elliot, to just to live the life that I was currently living. And then when something came along that I thought I wanted to jump into, then I would make sure that those parameters, being financial, emotional, spiritual, and physical, were in the place where I was able to do that. Mm-hmm. Does, does yeah, that answer I, your question? <laughs> it does, yeah. Because yeah. I think I think I'm in a similar position where I, I'm not necessarily planning for anything in particular in retirement or in the future, I have things I would like to do, but nothing is set in stone. All I know is that I am being fiscally responsible and setting something aside for the time when I may not be able to work or I choose to stop working. But I think there is something really unfortunate, at least in the United States, where we have a huge equity disparity in terms of where the wealth is. And as awesome as it would be for everyone to try to pursue their own dream career or dream side hustle to primary gig. Some people just don't have that flexibility or that opportunity. 
Mm. I'm going to completely disagree with you, Elliot. And <laughs> yeah. The reason right. I'm, the reason I'm going to say that is, and and the first comment or response I want to make to what you just said is, if you look at um, the world in general outside of the United States, you you have the same disparity when it comes to income potential um, at the moment, and you know poverty around the world is you know we all know that a huge amount of the global population I forget exactly what the numbers are, so I'm not going to quote it, but they live on you know a dollar a day, right? And mm-hmm. There's a huge part of the global population that lives on that. Um, what I've recognized throughout my life, and I guess I've been um, somebody that's done it to a certain extent, is that people can do whatever they want to do if they put their minds to it. And if you look at a lot of, you know, there's a lot of uh, examples in the business world. There's a lot of examples in the celebrity world where people come from very poor upbringings. They come from very, very poor families. Um you know, there's a there's a lot of um, comedians in America that I know of that have started off um, from very humble beginnings where their parents couldn't even put food on the table in some instances. But they have a passion and they had a passion all their lives and they actually got off their butts and they wanted to go and make that work. And I'm a true believer and that's why I'm doing actually what I'm intending on doing now with my shows because I want to show people that you can grow a global business within five years and something else I've done today is actually I've made the announcement today that I'm getting off social media as of next week. So I'm not going to be on social media. And I'm going to show people that you can grow a global business to a huge extent without being on social media today. Um, my personal account I'm talking about, I'm going to keep my business yeah. accounts on social media. Um, it, it all comes down to attitude. I, I think if you know you talk about people not having the opportunities, all you've got to do is walk out the front door of your house um, and start talking to people, and that creates an opportunity. So there'll be somewhere, someone somewhere that can give you a leg up and give you started, and, and there's plenty of people around that are goodwill enough to say, hey, I want to help you do this. I want to, I want to collaborate with you on this. Um, musicians are another great example. Look at the musicians that have been found from being buskers on streets around the world that have turned out to be superstars, right? And yeah. a lot of them have come from very humble beginnings. You know, a couple that are in my mind at the moment, you know, they were, they were sleeping outside on park benches a couple of years ago, and now they're selling 50 million album, uh, you know, sales in their albums. So um, I'm a firm believer that if you want to chase it, um, then you put the hard work in to get it. You can you can get anything in this world. I still think that's possible. I I really do want to believe that, but I think that there. I don't deny that there are a lot of people that have come from humble beginnings and that have come from basically living on the streets to becoming stars. But there are just as many people that have had the same level of ambition that haven't made it anywhere. I think I think there's a large part of making it. And from nothing that requires opportunity that's outside of your control. Are you familiar with Malcolm Gladwell? Yeah, absolutely. Outliers. I just spoke about the yeah. book in, in the last episode. Yeah. Have you read yeah, Outliers? He, I have. I yeah. have. And that's yeah. that's what I was going to refer to is that he, he basically breaks down why these people were became who they were. And it wasn't just because of their incredible intelligence or determination. They had assistance from loads of people to and opportunity from when they were kids to become who they were well yeah that as well but i will also quote from outliers that the ten thousand hours of hard work that has to go into mastery of anything that you decide to do in your life right and if i take anything out of outliers is you know he did he did the study on i think it was the canadian hockey team and and when they were actually born right and they were all yeah. born within August or July or things like that. Yeah. Right? And, and uh, you know, that stuff's fascinating because I'm a big believer in the zodiac signs too, being a big driver behind who you are in terms of your personality and, and what you're likely to do as an entrepreneur. But what I found most um, satisfying to read in that book is the 10,000 hours of, ma- of time that's required to master mm-hmm. any particular activity. So... My takeaway was still, and I'll still say it, that you can achieve anything if you put the time and the effort into it. Um, Because if you look at doing something for 10,000 hours, take this as an analogy, right? So um, take a plane ride. You you love flying, right? You love going on a holiday and traveling, Elliot. So let's use that as our analogy, (laughs) right? I'm a firm believer that your life journey is, is very much like a plane ride. Um, you get on the aircraft, first of all, at the beginning of your life where, where you're basically sitting in the departure lounge 
and that's when life is conceptualized and born uh, and then you come out into the big wide world and that might be you're getting on board the aircraft and sitting down for the first time in a seat on an aircraft and then you go through your, your early years and your teenage years and that's the pushback from the terminal and you're starting to go out onto the the, the taxiway, right? And then um, you get a lot bit further along in life, your working career, and you're starting to head towards the the takeoff runway. And this is the exciting part of life because you're not too sure what's going to happen when you get up in the sky, right? We've all got these mm -hmm. masterly plans that we're going to have this career and it's going to turn out like this. Quite often it doesn't. Uh, we get to the end of the runway, which is, you know, towards uh, the middle of our working career, and we start to roll down the runway. And then we go, well, hang on a minute. <laughs> I, I perhaps want to do something different in my life or I'm not really passionate about this and um, I'm a firm believer that those people that actually find their passion in life and that thing that they're really connected to they're the ones that take off and they're the ones that get up into the sky and they're the ones that get to see the beautiful white fluffy clouds that we all love seeing when we fly and looking down um, on the world from from above so I think in terms of our capacity to master something over 10,000 hours. It's a bit like that journey. We get to a stage through that 10,000 hours and there'll be somewhere, someone connecting. I'll give you an example, Elliot. I had it this morning, actually. I had it this morning. It happened to me. So you remember on my show with you, I talked about the Great Loop Project that I'm going to do in America. Yeah. yeah, okay. So, you know, that's been out there now for quite some time and I've spoken to a lot of people about it and I've got a lot of exciting things happen. I got a text message out of nowhere this morning from someone in America who's the youngest person that's ever done the Great Loop in a boat, okay? And that's awesome. Somehow they came across my name from somewhere and they said, hey, listen, I've, I've been told about your documentary project that you're doing with the Great Loop. I'd love to be part of it. This is what I can add in terms of value and my sister's going to be the second youngest person to do the Great Loop. And all of a sudden, just... This was an hour before you and I got on and started this, this show today. Um, this wonderful opportunity has been put in front of me of this young guy uh, doing whatever we're going to do on the Great Loop, and it's going to change people's lives, right? So that was just out of the blue passion. He's passionate about the Great Loop. I'm passionate about the Great Loop. And who knows what we're going to make out of, out, of, out of that, right? Yeah, I think I think – communicating with people and connections with people gets you the most out of what you want in life because you're never going to do everything 100% on your own. So let's go back to your school days when you were at um, elementary school. What was, what was your dream? What did you want to, what did you want to be in life and where did you want to go and what were all the big it's, picture dreams? It's interesting. The, so I think the first memory I have of wanting to be something was an architect I always loved playing with Legos. I always loved building things. I had like two scale models of different cars and other vehicles. And I, basically ever since then, I have been in either the construction or the design industry. And I think eventually I would like to teach at a university level. Both my mother and my father both worked at universities and my grandfather was an administrator at a university and it is a it's a pretty cushy life mm, mm. so is that what you're after you're after a cushy life yeah i cushy in the sense that they have flexibility they have enough income to do what they want they have the best parts of the year off so it to me it seems like retirement mm. okay well let me ask you this question then we, yeah. we when has there been a, a phase in your life or it could have been a day, a week, a month, a year where you felt the most out of your comfort zone? The most out of my comfort zone. That's a great question. There's not a lot of times in my life that I can recall feeling uh, like really uncomfortable and i don't know if that's just who i am but I'd, I'd say the most uncomfortable i felt the most out of body i've felt recently was when my mother was extremely ill and it was probably the week the two or three weeks around her getting really sick and then passing away in the few weeks after that 
Mm. It just, and it was right around the same time as the stay at home order for quarantine. So this was in early or late March that she passed away. And it just, it honestly still doesn't feel quite real, but that month probably made me feel the most uncomfortable I've ever been. Well, I just want to pass on my condolences for your mother passing. First of all, that's a thank you. That's a tough thing. So, what did what did that teach you about life? My mom had ovarian cancer for three years, and if there's anything that I learned from her is that she continued to work up until the month before she passed away, and she loved what she did. And that made me think, all right, I know I love what I do and I know I'm happy with what I do. So working it until the point that I can't work anymore is a pretty admirable and enjoyable life for me. And it really made me realize that I don't spend a lot of time with my family in terms of like, I don't see, I didn't see my mom a whole lot while I was in school. I didn't see my dad a whole lot while I was in school. And even now I don't get to see my dad that often only because of quarantine and he's an hour away. Um, but it made me want to spend more time with the people I love for sure. Cool. Have you read the book Chasing Daylight? I have not. Okay. I'm going to recommend it to you and to everyone watching the show today. I'm writing that down. It's one of those books that if I was a, um, a book guru, which I'm not, I would uh, say should be a mandatory read of every human being on the planet because when we're, particularly in these times that we're in now and listening to what you just shared then, Elliot, and I, and I want to thank you for sharing that because it's a very personal thing and I'm sure it's something that a lot of people listening today can relate to in terms of loss and the impact of loss in your life. It's a reality. It's something that's very, very sad, but it's something that's a reality in our world. Um, and I don't think we talk enough about it. it. I was just saying to somebody on one of my shows the other day that um, there is an art of dying and there's an art of grieving and there's an art of life mm -hmm. after that. And I don't think as a society we spend enough time talking about the impact on it. Um, you know, being a carer for somebody that's ill is a very difficult journey as well for a lot of people. Chasing Daylight, the book, is phenomenal. It's a um, it's written by a guy called Eugene O'Kelly. And if you want to have a read about um, the essence of life, just to give you a very quick synopsis of the book, Eugene O'Kelly was the CEO of KPMG in America. Um, very high power company executive. Uh, he was diagnosed with a brain tumor on the way to his office one morning when he had a headache and he thought it was nothing more than a headache. He stopped off at his uh, medical clinic on the way to work and got diagnosed with a brain tumor and was given 100 days to live. And the book is a tribute to his last 100 days on the planet because he actually did die. Um, and his wife actually ended up writing the last chapter, I think it was, or having an input to the last chapter. But what's so beautiful about this book is that he eloquently and articulately um, looks at how life should be capsulated if you were given 100 days to live. And he actually went about a very methodical, and you'll like this, Elliot, I'm sure. He went through a very methodical process to spend those last 100 days. He actually planned it out meticulously. <laughs> and I won't ruin any of any more, but because you need to read it and understand what he actually did in those last hundred days. Um, but it's a phenomenal read, "Chasing Daylight" by Eugene O'Kelly. Everyone, I highly recommend it. All right, you'll never be the same after reading that book. <laughs> there, <you go. laughs> there we go. So yeah, that's a that's an interesting one that you brought that one out of the closet in terms of you know your mum passing because getting out of your comfort zone. Um, I had a similar thing with my father not too long ago where I spent the last 25 days of his life by his bedside and we had a kind of a Tuesdays with Maury type situation where, um, yeah. although it was every day, not just on a Tuesday. <laughs> and yeah, it makes us real, realize a lot about connection, doesn't it? And yeah. how we take that connection for granted, particularly with our family. I think that's um, yeah. something that you're, you're talking about. Have you had a lot of De death to deal with in your life like have you known people that have died before this this is the closest um i still have i've talked about both my grandparents my my grandfather 
So my mother's stepdad, who was her in her life since she was 15, her father, my paternal or my maternal grandfather passed away when she was very young and he had ALS. But the man that my grandmother remarried was a fantastic father figure to my mom and her seven siblings. (laughs) And okay. Yeah. And he passed away in 2016. And that was probably the closest that I've been to death and someone that I knew really well. And that was also a really uncomfortable time for me. And I think death in general is just, it's hard to, understand it's hard to cope with i'm still trying to figure out why i'm feeling certain ways um i'm still trying to figure out if i should be remembering her more often and if i spent enough time with her before she passed away there's just so many questions that i i try not to think about too much because there aren't good answers Mm. Mm. do you get um do you get tough on yourself when you start thinking about those things? I don't know if I get tough on myself. I I think that I start to think about other things because I want to I want to remember my mom in the best ways that I can because remembering her in her last few weeks is not something that I want to do because I spent a lot of time with her in those really difficult um, situations and. I want to remember her in the best times, but I find myself thinking about the last few moments with her, which is not enjoyable, but I think it's an important part of the grief process. So I grapple with that in what I should, like, should I stop thinking about it? Should I force myself to stop thinking about it? Or should I just let myself think about it, but then become really saddened by it? Mm. So it's it's an interesting – it's feelings I've never felt before, but I know other people have and will feel it. Was there an opportunity to have conversations with your mum like I had with my dad at that time that were far greater in depth than what you had previously had in terms of communication and conversations? When she was first diagnosed with it and given her prognosis, which was only a few years, um, we had some in-depth conversations. But uh, her after Christmas, which we were able to spend with her side of the family, which included all 60 of us, they her health just rapidly declined from January to March and there wasn't a lot of conversation being had because she was either too tired or not able to get enough energy to talk. Mm. Mm. Okay. What What's your belief around um, after the physical life ends here on earth? What, what What's your belief around what happens next or does anything happen next? Or? I've grappled with this too. Um, I think in since this is the first time that someone really close to me has passed away that I don't necessarily think there's an afterlife. I think that individuals live on through the memories of the ones that are still alive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my mom, in the sense that she is no longer physically here, I still have memories of her, all of my aunts and uncles, my grandmother, we all still have wonderful memories my father, who has since remarried, has been telling me some of the some really interesting things from their early marriage that I had never known. And my sister and I talk about her, and she's definitely she's not able to be a part of the conversation, but she is definitely the conversation. What do you think stops us from having those kinds of conversations when people are alive? And they're there for them to still be able to participate in those kinds of conversations. Like I, I find this really fascinating, and it's not a it's not a judgment; it's an observation. By saying mm-hmm. um, the power of reflection is obviously obviously very powerful 
in the respect that we can actually sit down and go through our memory banks of someone's life and and pull out all these pieces that we want to right yeah but, but how often do we do it when they're still around and when we have the chance yeah. of, of doing that and I, I recently had that experience with a friend of mine that i hadn't seen or spoken to in about 15 years and this person was a huge hugely influential person in my life history and I made sure that we had a conversation a little bit like you and I are having now where we got really in depth about a lot of the really meaningful stuff and it was such a it was such a joyous occasion to be able to do that with someone and and I I didn't have to wait until one of us got to our funeral <laughs> where I was yeah, right. where I was reflecting on it and looking back and going oh that guy was a great guy and he did this for me and he did this for me and I just think there's so much to be gained from having those kinds of conversations now while we can, right? I don't, I don't know what your uh -huh. view is on that. No, I absolutely agree. I think the first time I realized was in, I think it was 2016 or 2015 when <laughs> you may laugh, but there were several major celebrity deaths uh, in the American world of film and TV. And I think like four or five people passed away and we were, everyone was starting to remember them. And then I think it was maybe a year after that, people were like, why, why are we remembering these people after they died? Let's start remembering people <laughs> yeah. while they're alive. And that made me think about trying to <laughs> interact with people and having more conversations with people that have had impact in my life. And it was probably two years ago, um, my wife and I go out to dinner very often and we love having you know intimate dinner dates with wine or beer and delicious food that we share tons of platters and then we'll have really in-depth conversations about life and other topics but the new york times had a list of i think 30 questions to ask anyone and it was basically you can ask a stranger these 30 questions and you will feel closer to them if not marry them afterwards after that three or four hour conversation wow that's a big uh, that's a big statement you'll marry them after really the 30 Christians, yeah i don't think that the new york times did said that <laughs> they were going to get married but one of the couples that they followed who answered the questions together that had no connection beforehand did get married um and one of those questions, they start out as very benign, like, what's your favorite band? And they continue to increase in sort of the severity or intimacy. And one of the questions in it is, if you could have one conversation with someone that you haven't had yet, what would it be and why haven't you had it? Yeah, great. And yeah, that's great. And that was when I realized that I needed to have more than just a casual conversation with my mom. And this was before she was diagnosed with, actually, no, I think it was after she was diagnosed. And I did end up having that conversation because of that question. Yeah, brilliant. So mm -hmm. that's really fascinating. So you talked earlier in the show about you're at a stage where you and your wife are going to start a family. And mm -hmm. what I'm interested to know now, based on what you've just shared with us, is are you going to take these conversations into your life moving forward with your children? Yeah, definitely. I, I can't wait to share what I've learned. Yeah, and yeah. I think I'm, I'm really excited to have kids, not just to... Because I know it is it is my choice to bring them into the world. And if I do not raise them or give them a, the attention or care that they need that is on me they didn't choose to come here mm, yeah that's a big one and it goes also back to something else that you've shared in the show today about getting that balance of life right so that you can actually spend quality time with your children to enable you to be able to do that right yeah absolutely yeah and do you remember the movie idiocracy yeah i do yeah yeah, yeah, so that was, I think it came out in 2006. Yep. And my wife and I joke about it because we're, I'm 29 and she's 28. And we thought about kids for, I don't know, eight years. 
we've always had that conversation. We've been together for 12 since high school. Um, but we've always known that we were going to have kids later in life to enjoy our young adult life together. And in idiocracy, the couple, the yeah. intelligent yeah. couple, yeah. Yeah. continues to postpone, continues to postpone, and eventually doesn't have kids because they're like, it wasn't the right time, we weren't ready, we didn't have our finances in order, even though they were absolutely fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah, we joke about that, but I think we're we're getting to the point where we're definitely ready. But you know, this whole COVID nineteen pandemic has really put a hamper on that because we're like. Do we really want to bring a kid into this world right now? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and there's a lot of yeah, a lot of deep thoughts around that process. That's for sure. Yeah. What about um, let's talk about how you met your wife. What what, what was the what was the dating <laughs> what was the dating scene scene there? What did you do to wow her and get grab her off her feet? Oh yeah, this is going to be so embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> Come on, spill the beans. I love this story, but. <laughs> I usually only tell it to people that are really close friends, so I'm I'm comfortable telling it to you, Mark. But for everyone else listening, I don't know if they really have earned it. <laughs> well, let let's but, say this way, Elliot, that maybe it's only going to be you, me, and Bob that watch this video. That makes you more comfortable, right? All right, all right, <laughs> all right. Bob Bob knows this story, so Bob, if you're listening, you you can tune out for a little bit, or you can re-listen to it. Hmm. Uh, so as I said, my wife and I met in high school. We went to the same school in the Reading area. And fun fact, I was in chorus with Taylor Swift. Ah, okay. She was in our high school. There yeah. you go. There's a yeah. name. There's a big name dropper. Boom. Yeah. Taylor so Swift. Taylor, if you're listening, I don't. <laughs> she was. She was. You were a year above me. I was in seventh grade while you were in eighth, and you were in the. Uh, what show was that? Sound of Music. And after that, she went off to Tennessee and made her music career. So yes, Amanda and I both went to Wyoming Missing, and we lived about three blocks apart. Neither of us really knew each other, but our high school was very small. We yeah. had total, we did have it as seventh through 12th grade, but each class was only like 120 to 140 kids. So there are only like 700 kids in our entire high school with seven grades or six grades. And we knew of each other, never really hung out, never really did any of that. Hmm. But her friend and I were friends. And so we started hanging out one summer before my senior year, before her junior year. And Amanda is very creative and likes to come up with games to play so they came up with this random card game that you play outside and you have to run around kind of like uh duck duck goose but with go fish kind of <laughs> okay okay <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so we played that and that was at our turf field and she was and still is very athletic and she was a three season athlete. And at the time I played mostly instruments. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So she was very confident in her ability as a jock that she could beat me in a foot race. Right. And so she challenged me to a hundred meter dash. And, uh, she told me in the beginning not to go easy on her. Right. And so I didn't, and I absolutely crushed her. <laughs> and at that point, she was like, all right, this kid's okay. <laughs> um, but one of the other things that really, I think, really drew her in and really sealed the deal was my uncanny ability to burp on command and extremely loud. <laughs> yeah. that'll, draw, yeah. that'll draw any girl in, that's for sure. Right. Yeah, and that's that was one of the things that real that I realized like, all right, if she likes that, she's pretty cool. She's okay. She's a keeper. She's a keeper. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so after that we went on a, a few a few short dates. Well not short dates. We ended up talking on the phone for like, I don't know, probably twelve hours in one week in the evenings. And she asked me, well, actually, she told me that she liked me. And I was like, you know what? I think I like you, too. 
There you go. You got the, I think I like you too. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> but I, was, I was in high school. I was like, I, I only, I've only known this girl for two weeks. So I don't know. Maybe I didn't know she liked me. I couldn't quite tell as a guy in high school dropping all these hints. You're like, Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But then we, we went to probably two weeks after that, we started dating. And after that, it has been officially 11 uh, 11 years and about 10 months. Wow. That's a very cool story, man. Very cool story. <laughs> Elliot, I'm just yeah. going to uh, pause for a second. You can probably see I'm getting a bit of sun uh, light coming in and destroying me. Didn't think you're going to have to put sunscreen on in the boat, did you? No, I didn't. And, uh, you know, it's it's a dangerous thing, this Aussie sun, because it uh, creates all sorts of horrible things on your body. I'm a I'm a skin cancer survivor, a melanoma survivor, wow. and um, very conscious of it these days. And I'm unfortunately not enough enough people around the world are cautious of skin cancers that lead to nasty things. So if you're out in the the sun in the northern hemisphere in the summertime at the moment, make sure you put sunscreen on or cover up. More importantly, um, because it doesn't yeah. take much. I, I met a guy. Um, who was at the skin clinic when I was there not so long ago, um, who was about a 17-year-old surfer here in Australia, and he had some uh, sunspots on his foot where he had been out surfing a lot, and he died yeah. two, two weeks later from melanoma skin cancer. So it doesn't, wow. it doesn't take a lot, folks, um, to get these nasty things. So cover up. Yeah, cover that's up. very scary. My... My grandmother that I mentioned had COVID uh, um, probably five or six years ago. Uh, it might have been longer than that. I'm not great with time. But she ended up getting a skin graft on her nose because she had uh, cancerous skin cells. So they had to cut off part yeah. of her yeah. nose and put new skin on. Mm, it's a nasty, nasty Can't tell thing. anymore. And, and it's something that we're um, probably not aware enough of in terms of the dangers of it. Is it. Melanoma is actually the deadliest form of cancer there is in terms of if you get it, bang, the chances are that it's because it's, it gets into your blood straight away. And, um, you yeah, know, that's the nasty side. So, yeah, cover up people. That's the, the story. Yes. Hey, yeah, that was a um, that was a fantastic story about meeting your wife, man. I love that. that was, <laughs> that's really good. So So you guys are in the process of assessing when's the right time to bring a child into the world yeah yeah we're both we bought our house last year and so we're both settled into our careers and we are like all right this is the next step we're ready and it's not i we've had long conversations about kids and we we roughly agree on how many to have we have countless girl names we have no boy <laughs> names um but we're both we're both excited to have kids and it's not just like oh we're supposed to have kids we're ex we're genuinely excited to have them you know what i gotta really uh acknowledge you and congratulate you on on this mindset that you have around that because i've i've done a lot of work um over the years internally about this whole marriage and having children and you know the successful relationships and unfortunately we've got to we've got to say that in this world today we live in a world where there's not a lot of successful relationships in terms of um, couples and then also the parenting process as well and that's why we have a I guess to a large extent a dysfunctional society because we have a lot of um, parenting issues and I've always been a firm believer that and this is why I congratulate you, Elliot, because you, you and your wife seem to be two people who have focused on getting your own lives in order first, focusing on your own happiness and satisfaction and contentment before you actually look at bringing somebody else into this world to, to travel their journey as well. And I think a lot of people, and I, I used to run a man's group um, a number of years ago where we brought groups of men together twice a week. Um, they sat in a room and we all talked about our issues in life, pretty much like you and I are doing today, but we focused on mm -hmm. men's issues. And um, as you wouldn't be surprised, a lot of men's issues come from their parents and the relationships they have with their parents, or should I say the relationships they don't have with their parents. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that volatility in men's, particularly I'm focusing on men because I ran the men's group and I can speak from experience, a lot of the volatility that comes in men's life is from that 
broken down relationship they had with their mother or their father. And a lot of them go out there and they get married and they have children and they take those issues into that situation with their children. And it's a very sad thing to see, of course, because those people haven't dealt with those, you know, sometimes they're very deep psychological issues that they're confronted with. So to actually sit here today and listen to a man um, and talking about his relationship with his wife and how you've sorted your own life out and got yourself prepared to actually bring a child into this world um, in the right, what I deem to be the right manner and right fashion. Uh, you need to be congratulated for that, mate. It's very good. Thank you very much, Mark. That means a lot. I'm sure and you're going to have a wonderful uh, family there going forward. No doubt about it. Thank you. I, I think in my life, my relationship with Amanda is one of the things I am most proud of. And the whole point of this podcast is about having conversations. And I think healthy relationships are founded on healthy conversations and being able to discuss stuff that you don't want to discuss like whether or not you want to have kids is a an important conversation you have before you get married and recently having to be a part of my mother's passing Amanda has been incredibly supportive and she's been extremely open to things I want to talk about and things I just don't want to talk about and we do, we talk about difficult things all the time mm. and it's never, our relationship hasn't been hunky dory for 12 years. There's been ups and downs like there is in individual lives, but you have the conversations about what is under your skin, what is, what is making you feel the way you feel about the relationship and being able to discuss it openly is the best thing that we have ever done. And at a certain point when we were in college, I think we realized that we were having a lot of uh, just small bickerings, just small little uh, spats about stuff that really did not matter whatsoever. And we were like, well, why are we doing that? That doesn't, it doesn't solve anything. Let's just stop having those ridiculous little fights. And so we pretty much, if we start to have one of those fights, we're like, wait, let's just stop and let's think about what we're doing. And that's, then that's brilliant that you're <laughs> conscious. That's brilliant that you're conscious of that, though. That's really, really good. Mm. I think I think the consciousness of one's actions so being mindful right yep my sister my sister is and if sam if you're listening i have growing up with you is very difficult but i've learned a lot from growing up with you directly and indirectly and just to everyone else listening my sister has been was diagnosed with bipolar disorder at a fairly young age and she had attempted to take her life several times uh, throughout her life unsuccessfully, thankfully. And I think she would, is very thankful that they were unsuccessful as well. Um, and recently she was diagnosed with a later stage schizoaffective, which includes bipolar, but with some paranoia. So growing up in high school with her was very trying for my parents and I did not get a lot of attention from that because they were directing it towards her. But I learned a lot from her and being independent and her, her path in her treatment, uh, understanding her bipolar disorder, understanding her schizoaffective disorder, was knowing how she was feeling and why she was feeling it. Mm -hmm. So she is a huge impact on me on understanding mindfulness on basically even when I'm sitting working at my computer, when I feel like I'm not having any emotion, I'm still having some kind of emotion. There are days when I'm at baseline a little bit happier. And I will say the last two days, I've just been kind of grumpy. And I told Amanda this. I was like, Amanda, I don't know why. I don't know what's causing it. But I have been grumpy for the last two days. So I apologize if I have been short with you or if I haven't been nice. 
just know that is why. And that is all tying back into the conversation about conversations with relationships because knowing and being able to give yourself that out of body, look at your conversation from an outsider's perspective is incredibly beneficial to yeah. facilitating the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And also, I would throw in there the word trust because if you didn't have the relationship you have with your wife today, Amanda, you wouldn't trust yourself in being able to be that open and transparent in your communication. And and I think mm -hmm. it's only when you trust somebody at that level that you feel as, okay, there's not going to be any judgment here. It's just going to be, I can share whatever I'm feeling. It's going to be okay. But I'm conscious enough that I want to get this off my chest, right? Yeah, mm. absolutely. You nailed know, you know mm. it. Mm. So do you meditate? I don't, actually. Mm. Is there a reason why you don't? Is it just something you just never gave a go to have you ever tried meditation i have um i tried meditation after and while reading sam harris's book waking up mm -hmm. and I, that was actually something that my sister she didn't specifically get me into waking up but i think maybe bob had talked about sam harris because i think he has a podcast as well um but waking up was interesting to me because i'm not a religious person but I find spirituality interesting because you can be spiritual without a religion. Absolutely. Yeah. And mm -hmm. having the ability to meditate and understand what's going on, I think ties very closely in with mindfulness. So yeah, while I was reading the book, there are segments where he's like, all right, now just close your eyes and think and try not to think or see the thoughts in your head pass by. Just like sitting at a bus stop and seeing the cars go by but not actually giving into those thoughts. Hmm. And I haven't done it since then, though. So it's been probably a year or two. Okay. And and what did you find when you, you tried it? Was there any impact at all? I do. I find it really peaceful. Um, at baseline, I think I have a, a mindfulness mentality where I, I live – very much in the moment, which is probably why Bob and I are very different in our planning styles, because I kind of, I get the hierarchy of the trip planned out, and then let the rest of the details filter in, and Bob plans some of his trips down to the 15-minute increments. Wow. So you're the and, macro guy, and he's the micro guy. Yeah. Yeah. Which I will say plays very well into our uh, dynamic as the co-host of the Traveler's Blueprint, because we both feed off of each other and help each other see things that the other doesn't in terms of the big picture and some of the smaller pieces of the podcast. It's fun. Yeah, I imagine so. I imagine so. Do you like apples? The fruit or yeah, the company? The fruit. <laughs> I love apples. Okay. So can I give you a small task to do next time you have an apple? And yeah. Um, to report back to me on on what I'm about to explain to you, okay? Absolutely. So next I'll time, next time you have an app on, here's to anybody listening today who uh, wants to try this. If you haven't done it before, there's a lot of people that have done this, but there's a lot they haven't. I'd like you to take 20 minutes to eat the apple, okay? And I'd like you to be mindful of every single senses that you're using when you eat the apple. So what it tastes like, every single bite, what it tastes like, um, how how the juices taste in your mouth, how the skin of the apple. So before you even eat it, I want you to spend three or four minutes actually just touching it, just feeling the apple, apple, you know, the little piece that sticks out the top, the skin of the apple, all these and all these kinds of things. Yeah. And do it. Do it like a meditation. So the apple is the only thing you're focused on in your world at that particular time. So lock yourself away in a closet somewhere when you do this <laughs> so you don't get distracted by it. So don't do it while you're on your computer doing um, a Traveler Blueprint podcast or something, right? So Yes. <laughs> so sit, sit down and make sure it's the only thing that's going on in your life at that particular time. And take 20 minutes to eat that apple, right? And then... After you've used all your senses uh, in, in finishing that apple and putting the core 
wherever it is you put your apple cores because some people you know crush them up and use them in juices other people plant them in the garden other people put them in the right trash and whatever some so whatever you know. whatever you do <laughs> whatever you do with your apple core and then let me know you know send me a message and say hey this is what i actually experienced yeah tell me tell me what you actually experienced i'd like to know your connection with that apple i will do that i will do that yeah. um and there for anybody is a... else listening too that's watching this if you're going to do it Drop me a note and let me know what your experience was like with that apple. I'd really like to know how, how you yeah. got connected to that apple. Um, are you familiar with Barbara Kingsolver? She's an author. Did Animal Vegetable Miracle? No, I am not. So she does a lot of books uh, kind of around the idea of you know sustainability and uh, basically providing for yourself on small on a small piece of land yep. and being at one with kind of the food and where it comes from and yourself. So one of the things that she talked about was her trip to Italy and how especially older Italian men would close their eyes when they ate. Right. And I, <laughs> I've done this every once in a while and I sometimes do it unintentionally but when i do it intentionally when i'm with amanda she'll sometimes roll her eyes at me <laughs> <laughs> and we're like why are you doing that i was like because it tastes so much better when you actually think about all the flavors all the combinations that's going on and then you pair it with a sip of wine and then you get this whole new bouquet of smells and flavors that come with the mixing of the food and the wine. Yeah, absolutely right. So if you're out there watching this today or listening to it, uh, Elliot and I will make sure that we put the uh, the notes of these books that we've both recommended now um, throughout the show. So you can grab those if you want to have a read of them. Um, there's been a couple of good ones that we've we've shared today. That's so true about that. And there's a, a number of restaurants around the world now that actually blindfold you before you go in and um you actually have to go through that process of when you're eating yeah. right so that that's good cool. yeah. and yeah, also the there's experience. a couple that you eat in darkness as well there's restaurants that are completely blacked out and you can't actually <laughs> see what you're eating so that would be that would be fun yeah it would be, it would be fun i haven't been to one yet i want to go to one of those so if you're out yeah. there and you can tell me where one of those are i'd like to i'd like to find out and, and go one. yeah tag me in that yeah okay cool well listen elliot i'm going to let you go mate it's been fantastic talking to you today i've really enjoyed this conversation so i first of all want to do a couple of things the first thing is i want to thank you for giving me of your time because time is the most precious thing we have in life and you've given me more than an hour and a half today to have a wonderful conversation so thank you for that and also thank you for the depth of conversation because that's exactly why i started the show i don't believe that we have enough conversations like this in our life particularly with strangers and people we don't know that well um, and I think it can really open up a whole new um, opportunity, not only in our own lives, but someone that's listening to this conversation out there as well. I'm sure that we've um, sparked some motivation, inspiration, or even knowledge sharing with uh, with the people today. So I really appreciate it, Ali. Hopefully. Thank you very much, Mark. It's been a joy. And, um, you know, sometime in the future, we'll get you back on because I'm sure plenty of listeners would like to know when the, the family starts with Elliot and yes. <laughs> uh, how that's all progressing and, you know, how you, how you maintain that balance that you and Amanda have today because, um, yeah, it's very special what you two have. And please send my best regards to Amanda as well when you get off the call today. I will. Thanks, Mark. So there we go, folks. That's another episode of Conversations with Humanity. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'm speaking to people all over the world about, well, whatever comes up that's what the show is all about so if you want to be on the show have a shout out to us and uh, we'll catch up with elliot sometime soon thanks again elliot yeah thank you